what you just described that you don't suddenly flip a switch and you go from no bipolar disorder to bipolar disorder. Um, one of the things I've learned in the last couple of years is there's really a bipolar spectrum. Yeah. And I, I, you know, in looking back and working with, you know, several psychiatrists, I was on that spectrum from a pretty early age. And they, you know, one expert said you had what we call hyperthymia or a hyperthymic personality, meaning okay a consistent level, a uh, low level of mania, which gave mm -hmm. me extra energy, drive, enthusiasm, problem solving skills. And it really took whatever talents I had and elevated them and gave them a boost. Mm -hmm. um, and I was pretty much up almost all the time. Hey friends, welcome to the WellMind podcast, a space for meaningful conversations about a broad range of wellness related topics. My guest in this episode is retired Major General Greg Martin. He is a 36-year Army combat veteran, celebrated for his remarkable career commanding engineer units and holding prestigious roles such as President of the National Defense University and Commander of Fort Leonard Wood. An accomplished author, his book Bipolar General, My Forever War with Mental Illness candidly shares his journey. He has advanced degrees from MIT, the Naval War College, and the Army War College. In our conversation, we walk through his storied military career and simultaneously unpack his private battle with bipolar disorder. As his story unfolds, I found it fascinating how for many years, the periods of elevated mood that accompany bipolar disorder actually enhanced his ability to perform under intense conditions. However, as you're going to hear, this diminished over time as his mental health condition worsened to the point of personal crisis. Yet Greg's indomitable spirit and the support of his loved ones helped him move out of crisis and into triumph. Greg's story is really one of hope, resilience, faith, and recovery. And his new mission is to break down stigma around mental illness and empower others through education. I really enjoyed my conversation with Greg, and I know that you will as well. So please join me in welcoming retired Major General Greg Martin in episode 39, Triumph Over Crisis. Well, thanks, Ben. It's great to be here, and I appreciate you bringing me on. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, Greg, I think it would be wonderful if we could just start uh, by just talking a little bit about who you are. Um, and we can do that in the kind of long form uh, of, of kind of discussing your, your pathway and your trajectory, certainly personally and, and through your military service and those kind of things. But maybe it's good for our audience just to hear a little bit about uh, where you're at right now in life, um, and, and kind of what what things you're you're working on. Well, where I'm at right now is a long way from where I started. It's been a you know it's been for the most part a great journey, uh, and then you know bipolar disorder really turned my life upside down, inside out. Went through bipolar hell for about two years, hospitalized, um, pretty much fired from my job, uh, forced to retire. Um, but the good news is, um, seven years ago, once I started, uh, I was prescribed lithium, my depression vanished, my psychosis vanished, and I haven't had any depression or any mania since then in seven years, which is great. Um, yeah. during the last seven years, uh, you know, being a military guy, I, I have to have a mission or a purpose statement. And so I thought about it, prayed about it, and came. it came to me that my mission statement is sharing my bipolar story to help stop the stigma, promote recovery, and save lives. And so that's what I do now. That That is my mission, it's my purpose, it's really how I live my life. Um, and I do that through speaking, writing, and conferring. 
and it's extremely rewarding. And from all the feedback I've gotten, you know, it's it's pretty effective. Uh, people appreciate yeah. hearing my story, you know, really candid and raw. Um, yeah. You know, my, uh, you know, what really pulled me out of the pit of bipolar hell was, you know, God and faith is a huge part of my life. Um, my, the medical professionals that I think, you know, the Lord works through and gives them the knowledge and the skills to do great things. Um, my wife, who really was steadfast and dedicated and, you know, never gave up my family and some, some really key friends. Um, so I, I really feel like I'm blessed. I, I believe I'm doing the most important work of my life. I think what I did in the army was pretty important, but I think this is much more so and impacts many more people. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's we're really on the cusp of, you know, you were talking about uh, doing a lot of speaking and writing. We're right on the cusp of the release of your book, uh, Bipolar General. Um, that's going to be, and, and we'll spend some time today talking about that book and, and that process of uh, publishing something like that, because that's no, that's no small feat uh, for sure. Um, and, and it takes a lot of dedication and drive, uh, to do that. So we'll, we'll spend some time talking about that. I, I definitely want to get into, um, some of the content and focus of your book, but, um, I'm really curious, like you've, you've had, a, you had a long military career. Um, and, and so kind of going even back to those formative years, because, uh, you attended, uh, West Point. I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm just curious, like, how does one decide to go to West Point? That That's no small mission or goal. That That's quite a, a process in doing that. So I, I'm, I'm curious just where this, uh, this desire for service to your country, where did that really start or come from? I think it came from my family. My dad was a World War II Navy veteran. And I had many of most of my uncles had all served in either the Army, the Navy or the Coast Guard. So it was sort of in the family, in my DNA. And uh, when I was in high school, you know, I was typical overachiever, you know, good grades, a lot sure. of athletics, leadership. Yeah. And I wanted to go to a, the best college that I could for the best price because our family didn't have a whole lot of money. And so I found out about the service academies and they're very highly ranked colleges mm -hmm. and the government provides a full scholarship and the payback for that is five years active duty service obligation so i i said i applied i got into west point i said hey what the heck give it a try i always wanted yeah. to go in the military anyway and yeah. i i fell in love with west point and graduated near the top of my class very high in physical education and sports and high in leadership and then when it was came time for um, serving out in the active field army, um, I really looked forward to it. I was excited about it. Um, and once I got out there, was, I was in Germany during the Cold War. You know, mm -hmm. we, I, I fell in love with leading the soldiers, helping them to, to be trained, helping them with their personal family problems. Um, and pretty soon I said, man, this is great. And so I was a platoon leader. Then I was a, co a company commander doing pretty important, exciting, dangerous things. Plus, you know, got to travel quite a bit in Europe. And uh, and then after that, the Army said, hey, you're doing really well. We want to keep you in. How about how would you like to go to graduate school on, you know, the Army's dime? So I ended up going to yeah. MIT and yeah. got, you know, two masters and a Ph.D. And then for the rest of my time in the Army for the next, you know, few decades, I got nothing but top ratings, doing all the key jobs, doing all the military schooling, et cetera. And so I was really kind of an overachiever. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just, by that time, I just loved the army so much, being around soldiers, the mission, that I never really thought seriously about getting out again. And then the next thing I know, I had over 30 years. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, how, how interesting that, uh, you know, you were stationed in Germany, of all places during the cold war. Right. I, I, uh, had an opportunity, uh, well now a couple of decades ago of spending some time in Germany. Um, and, uh, a lot, lots of parts of 
what used to be Eastern Germany and spent time in East Berlin and those kind of things. So there's still, I mean, you know, decades and decades later, still, uh, you know, the impact in that country uh, of, of that time of division. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, just as your first deployment overseas, kind of, you, you said you enjoyed it. You, there were aspects that, that were uh, really enriching for you and fulfilling. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what, what parts of that initial experience stand out to you the most still today? Um, first off, being in Germany was really excellent. It was just a great cultural experience. I lived uh, on a on a German farm, you know, out on the German economy, learned German. And then I would go, of course, to the American army base where the, the troops were. And we trained continuously and we did all the logistics and maintenance on the equipment. And then we would uh, move out into our alert positions periodically. And then from there, we would go out and do reconnaissance of our actual war fighting positions. Mm. And so I was a combat engineer in charge of a combat engineer platoon and then company. And the missions, we would integrate in with uh, the mechanized infantry forces, the armor forces, the cavalry, the artillery. And we would put in, for the most part, obstacles um, that would slow down the Soviet army. So we put in uh, tank ditches, barbed wire obstacles, um, as well as fighting positions to so that the tanks and the infantry fighting vehicles and the artillery could drive down into what are basically holes carved out by a bulldozer. And so they would be down under the ground with just their, their gun tube up above the ground. So they were much more protected. And so that was pretty exciting. And the, yeah. the Soviets had a huge advantage over us in terms of numbers of troops and all that. So we kind of morbidly consider ourselves speed bumps and that we would be on a suicide <laughs> mission. And wow. uh, But the morale was really good. The troops were okay. good at what they did. Um, and, and then we also, because we were engineers, during the warm summer weather, we would do big construction projects. And, you know, we would take all of our equipment and we would build um, all kinds of facilities. The the most notable were these state-of-the-art tank ranges, gunnery ranges for the NATO forces in Grafenwehr, Germany. And that was a great experience. I mean, it was very hard, challenging technically, and also just leading and managing the people and the equipment so that we could get maximum production because we had to work pretty much 24 seven with yeah. floodlights and everything in order to get this stuff done on a tight timeline. And so you had to develop sleep plans. Um, you had to be able to figure out how to get the troops home to see their families on the weekend. You needed to have maintenance plans so that, mm-hmm. you know, you would dry, you would run the equipment for so many hours and then you'd have to pull it offline do a maintenance stand down to keep the stuff running for months at a time. So that was very exciting, but it wasn't all work. Um, There was a lot of enjoyable stuff. I met my wife there when I was a second Lieutenant. Um, We got married a couple of years later. Uh, We traveled all around Europe. I mean, all of Mm. the Western European countries we went to, we visited, took up skiing and had, you know, just a wonderful time skiing in the Austrian and the German and the Swiss Alps. So we had a lot of fun that went with the exciting work. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, so there's, there's these elements of uh, uh, solving problems, designing structures, creating facilities that are going to be used by lots of other uh, troops uh, throughout that time and and very rigorous demanding work is what it sounds like. Um, but then then kind of a, a flip to these times where you're just, I mean, it kind of sounds like that would be a dream vacation for some people <laughs> to right, to go skiing in the Swiss Alps or something like that, kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity or something. and and so you you kind of had these uh, extremes even uh, at that point of like work, work, work. And then, boy, we're just going to have a lot of fun, enjoy our time and get out of, you know, get out of these uh, military countries and get into a place where we can have recreation and downtime. And and so really contrasting uh, experiences all wrapped into that one period of time for you. 
Absolutely. And as you just described it, um, our motto in my platoon was work hard, play hard. And that's exactly <laughs> what we did. Yeah. And as you were saying yeah. it, 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 it popped into my head just for the first time that in a way it was kind of a bipolar like experience mm. to go mm -hmm. from one extreme to the other and then right back into the, the other extreme. And that's what I did for six years straight. Yeah in yeah. germany yeah um so so when i, I I'm, I'm curious about that parallel i guess because um oftentimes uh like a bipolar disorder um it emerges uh over time and it's not something that it's like um you know one day uh, uh switch flips and all of a sudden i'm having this experience but um, you know, depressive episodes oftentimes are kind of the first um, initial phases of, of a bipolar disorder. And sometimes that happens even in like young adulthood and those kind of things. So I'm, I'm curious, during this time where, you know, you highly successful at uh, West Point, uh, really enjoying that, that deployment and that service, um, work hard, play hard mentality that really fit for you. What what were what was your mental health experience during that period of your life? Um, well, thanks for asking. And what you just described that you don't suddenly flip a switch and you go from no bipolar disorder to bipolar disorder. Um, one of the things I've learned in the last couple of years is there's really a bipolar spectrum. Yeah. And I, I, you know, in looking back and working with, you know, several psychiatrists, I was on that spectrum from a pretty early age and they, you know, one expert said you had what we call hyperthymia or a hyperthymic personality, meaning okay. a consistent level, a uh, low level of mania, which mm -hmm. gave me extra energy, drive, enthusiasm, problem solving skills. And it really took whatever talents I had and elevated them and gave them a boost. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, pretty much up almost all the time. But I did have a depressive experience. I went away to college for one year before West Point. And okay. I went from high school hero to college zero because mm. I didn't have good study skills. High school was too easy. And so I, I did terribly my first semester. I mean, I had all Fs and I was doing awful. And um I was able, I had a um, very intense religious born again experience during that semester at, at the University of Maine. And once I accepted the Lord as my, you know, personal savior, everything changed. Mm. I suddenly, I cleaned my room. I organized my notes. I, I came up with a disciplined schedule where I was studying during these times. I was going out running and lifting weights. So I had a very disciplined schedule. And, you know, started memorizing Bible verses, going to church again. And um, but I went from very depressed to all of a sudden this intense religious experience. And what I would describe as, again, probably hypomania. Um, yeah. yeah. And then I reverted back to my, you know, uh, hyperthymic personality all through West Point, out into the army accomplished all kinds of big things. I mean, you yeah. know, I talked about West Point, Army Ranger School, successful officer, ran seven marathons under three hours, um, you know, the degrees at MIT, got been married for 41 years, top ratings in the Army, got promoted to two-star. So my whole life has been, you know, I think elevated by my yeah. bipolar brain or living on the spectrum. Yeah. And the and, and that was all great. It worked to my advantage. But year after year, decade after decade, my condition inched up that bipolar spectrum and got higher and higher and higher. And then the crucible was combat in Iraq, where <laughs> the, you know, the euphoria, the thrill, the trauma, the stress of leading thousands of soldiers in combat, it uh, triggered my genetic predisposition for bipolar disorder. And again, okay. I went into, you know, real mania, but it wasn't crazy mania. It was very high performing. I never felt that good in my life 
I felt like Superman. I was performing at the highest level I've ever been at. And that lasted for the whole year of war in Iraq. But when we went back to Germany, I plunged into depression, 10 months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then over the next 11 years, my uh, bipolar disorder got worse and worse. My my yeah. manic highs got higher and higher. My depressive lows got lower and lower until 2014. I went into full blown mania, and and I can talk about that. But that's when sure. I was fired from my job, forced to retire, hospitalized, and and, and luckily I was diagnosed correctly yeah. with bipolar disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, yeah. There's a lot to sort through in that. Uh, kind of brief synopsis that you gave, um, and and I I don't want to miss I don't want to miss anything. So there's uh you've you've talked about your faith uh, and your connection with God and a couple of times now already. And and so if it's all right with you, I want to I, I do want to go there. I I, I want to think through that with you um, because uh, I think oftentimes when we're discussing issues of mental health, we're very keen to look at it from a, a biological standpoint, which is very true and valid. We're uh, apt to look at it from a maybe a social standpoint in terms of how, how our mental health impacts our relationships. And certainly that's the case uh, for you. And I'm hearing in this story as well. And, uh, and then also just the psychology of it. What is it doing internally to how we think and how we perceive and how we decide and act and, and those kind of things. But I think there's a, uh, an important spiritual component to our mental health as well. And, and so uh, early on, as you talk about this, um, really uh, formative uh, faith or religious experience um, and, and becoming reconnected with God and uh, placing that as a high priority in your life, that that really, it was really beneficial at the time, but it was also kind of overlapping with this kind of hypomania that you were talking about. Um, so, so as you've, um, maybe this is going to be kind of a hard question, but as, as you've moved through these different you know, seasons uh, of your life, seasons of uh, experiencing bipolar disorder. Where, what, what has faith meant to you uh, through the course of time? Um, in, in terms of either a a support for you, or or even maybe something that's been challenging for you. Well, faith has always been important to me. I was. Uh, grew up Catholic in a Catholic family. And the first time I ever had this idea of, um, you know, God being or Christ being a personal savior was during that intense experience at, at the University of Maine. Yeah. That was a life-changing experience. And one of the things that it did for me is, I, you know, I really think the Holy Spirit came into me and elevated everything in my mm -hmm. person. Um, I also started memorizing key power verses from the Bible, and those yeah. stuck with me to this day. And I've fallen back on them and leaned on them and drawn strength and wisdom and, and power from them. So that has continued on. Um, I would say that, you know, I got married to Maggie in the Catholic Church, and we had three kids. And we um, we brought the kids up Catholic. We went to mass. We you know stayed um, with the Catholic tradition, but kind of on the side, I had a separate, parallel, intersecting track going with kind of you know more of the born again evangelical movement. Mm -hmm. And again, I found that very um, very comforting and very strengthening. And there was a, so many intersections between. Catholicism and, you know, this evangelical flavor of, of uh, Protestantism. Um, and I, I kept that going year after year, decade after decade. And I think it really probably helped my performance a lot because the basic principles of military leadership are the same principles and virtues of the Christian faith. I mean, mm. they they really overlap perfectly. So someone who lives a really solid Christian life is probably going to be a, a very solid military officer. 
Um, okay. And so many of the principles to be a good leader, a good officer in the military, even if you have no religious affiliation or background, you're probably practicing in your life those tenets that mm -hmm. Christianity teaches. So mm -hmm. I think that that helped me a lot. Um, I also think that religion and the military kind of gave me some guardrails in my life that probably okay. protected me from going um, bipolar earlier than I did. Because mm -hmm. I, I just think I had these guardrails uh, between the, the structure and the discipline and the routine of military life, and then the tenets of the Christian faith. So I think that helped me a lot. Um, then it did take a bit of a change, though. Once you know, I had my bipolar onset in 2003, you, as you know, you know, one of the tenets or sim, uh, symptoms of bipolar disorder is, uh, or mania, is religiosity. Mm -hmm. And over the next 11 or 12 years, I became more and more religious until, the, until I got to the point where by 2014, I was probably doing 25 or 30 significant religious events per week, mm -hmm. going to multiple Protestant churches, multiple Catholic masses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a stretch I went to. I went to mass, received communion, and did confession every day for 49 days. Mm -hmm. um, I was teaching, going to multiple Bible studies, prayer breakfast, teaching discipleship courses at a whole bunch of different um, churches, um, memorizing, you know, as many as five or 10 Bible verses every morning, and then reciting them all day. And so I think... And, and then I also had an experience where I was speaking in tongues. I had hallucination uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, I saw the Holy Spirit descend and, you know, come down. I had mm -hmm. uh, hallucinations that devils and demons had were attacking our house. So I put crosses and Bibles in all the windows and at the doors. And I had I had this um, delusion that I was the Apostle Paul in uniform sent by God to reform the U.S. military. Um, mm -hmm. And so I believe that those were symptoms of uh, religiosity, where I really was going overboard in terms yeah. of, you know, my religious practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, as you put it, that that's that is incredibly um, like. I think that's representative of a number of people that experience bipolar disorder because uh, it it doesn't leave any part of us or our life untouched, right? Every, everything um, is kind of what I would say like fair game to both depression and to mania. And so things that take a lot of priority in our life, of course, get um, kind of zoomed in on in those manic episodes, right? And so that's what you're talking about here, where here's something that has been an incredibly fundamental and foundational source of support and guidance for you through life as you face different challenges and as you form relationships with people, specifically your wife and your your family of creation that you have with her, like all of that um, really strong, solid support and guidance and comfort through that. And then the the mental health issues kind of get hooked into that, right? And and start to twist or distort your perspective and practice of them. And so that that's that's important because you know when I think about the work that I've done as a mental health counselor, I've worked in both um, maybe what I would say like faith based settings as I'm working with people like they're they're expecting or wanting their Christian faith to be an active, integrated part of their mental health care. And then I've worked in uh, more traditional settings that, you know, hospitals and outpatient clinics and things like that. And there can be a, a judgment of like, oh, if somebody's expressing, you know, religious beliefs, um, that that's maybe symptomatic of their mental health issue. And I think it's just more complicated than that mm -hmm. because it, it can be both. It can be both a source of 
like you were talking about support, strength, guidance, reassurance, comfort, um, but it can also get hooked by some of these mental health things. And that's a way that, um, you know, whether we say it's, um, you know, the, the sinful world or the devil or whatever, as a way of trying to use that against us to separate us from God's love. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's why we need, we need to be able to have these conversations in light of our faith, in light of our spiritual struggles, as well as our spiritual resources. So I really appreciate you, you sharing those experiences, Greg. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of value in that. So, so then as you kind of going back to, to 2003, because you, you identified that as kind of a inflection point with some of these mental health struggles, what was going on in life at that point for you? Well, I had taken command of the engineer brigade and a brigade is made up of, you know, several thousands of troops and it can expand to two or three times that size. It's a flexible organization. So I took okay. command in uh, summer of 2002, went to Germany, and we knew at that point, summer of 2002, that we were going to go to war in Iraq. You know, it, it, it was all secret, but it was pretty clear that the president and the administration had made their mind up that they were gonna get rid of Saddam Hussein. And the, the unit that was the main army unit that was going to do that was a, an outfit called um, Fifth Corps. And a corps is a three-star command that can can be can go up to over 100,000 troops, even 200,000. And so we spent from the summer of 02 into the winter and when we finally deployed, training rigorously on the tasks and the missions that we would have to do to attack from Kuwait to Baghdad. Um, we did tremendous amount of med medical work to make sure that all of our troops were up to snuff health-wise, medical-wise for this harsh desert environment. We did tremendous work on the logistics, making sure we had all, all of our equipment was maintained and ready to go. We had plenty of uh, repair parts and everybody knew how to fix and maintain all this key equipment that we had. And then there's a there's a lot of uh, administrative work you have to do to get the soldiers ready. I mean, you have to do wills, power of attorneys, planning to get, you know, make sure that the families are taken care of. So if, if the families were going to stay in Germany, you had to have a plan when all the troops left on how are we going to manage and take care of and support all these families that that are by themselves in Europe. Um, okay. And then a lot of them would go back to the States. So anyway, all of this took, it consumed our time and our energy from the summer of 02 to the winter of 03. And it was very stressful, lots of hard work, very long, hard uh, work hours, you know, typically from early in the morning doing physical training into the late evening hours, you know, getting all the work done for the day. And then with lots of war games and preparation and, and things like that. And so finally, um, we got an alert uh, to go. Saddam Hussein was very clever. He, he usually would, uh, he would ring the bell and, you know, cause us to do alerts and deployments on uh, the, the, when a big holiday came. So it was on mm -hmm. Christmas Eve, 2002, mm -hmm. he started rattling his saber. And that's when we got the deployment order to go. And so okay. we we deployed all the forces out of Germany into Kuwait, and then in Kuwait it was again very very intense. We had we had about a month and a half to, to get all of our equipment off of the offloaded from the ships, and you know all the weapons, the communications equipment, the nuclear biological chemical equipment, and get it all together and put it into a integrated harmonious whole that was ready to carry out the mission of attacking to Baghdad. Wow. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of troops deployed from the United States and they came into Kuwait and we had to receive them and their equipment and integrate them into our Germany-based units and, and then do uh, rehearsals out in the desert, live fire drills in the desert, 
you know, in-depth planning, you know, moving literally mile by mile over the battlefield from Kuwait to Baghdad. And so that's what it was like. It was very intense. It was exhausting. Yeah. Um, you, you know, there was no room for error because if you, if you make errors in doing this stuff, you know, soldiers are going to die. And, um, yeah, very I high will tell you, when we finally attacked on March 18th, 2003, when we finally went across the line, I felt a huge sense of relief because mm. those months and months of preparation and training finally were over and we were on the move doing what we had trained to do. So it's kind of ironic that, you know, the most dangerous thing, the war was yeah. I, I, everybody felt relief that we were finally mm -hmm. uh, beyond the training and the preparation. Yeah. Yeah. That, and, and while it, yeah, at face value seems counterintuitive the way you've just described it makes complete sense though, because, because there's so much, like, like I said, so much at stake during that preparation time. So many people counting on you, counting on, on leadership to be able to guide them through this preparation process. So there was no, there was no chance for rest. There was no chance for recovery. It was just um, full gas that whole time. And then, like you said, one, once uh, that movement happened and you, you engaged in the actual combat process, then that's that was probably all of your focus at that point, right? And just yes. responding, um, you know, tactically or mechanically or whatever it was that you were working on at that point um, to make that uh, a successful uh, mission. Yes, um, you know, we had a very uh, well designed, carefully orchestrated plan you know, from objective, objective, all the way up the battlefield. And um, it was it was a great plan. And I went to each of the key engineer points, mission sites on the battlefield. But the enemy has a vote. And so your mm -hmm. best laid plans get disrupted by an aggressive, motivated enemy. And uh, so that that was quite an experience. Yeah. Yeah. So this this. um <clears throat> high stress, high demand, high stakes environment kind of became this pressure cooker for you in terms of your own personal mental health. Um, and so you probably, like you've talked about already, you know, leaned into maybe some of the predispositions that you have for high energy, high drive, um, and, you know, little, little sleep, little attention to self-care, those kind of things, and just putting all, you know, the whole of yourself into whatever the goal is at that point. And those predispositions, like you said, kind of stretched you beyond what you had done before, at least <clears throat> to the point where now it was like that, that it sounds like was probably where you recognize one of the first more significant manic episodes. Is that accurate? Yes, you described it perfectly. And, you know, there's no doubt I was manic in Iraq, but luckily it didn't get out of control mania. It was, mm -hmm. it just elevated me across the board. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and again, it was unknown, unrecognized, undetected for 11 years. So it wasn't yeah. until 11 years later that it people recognized, hey, there's something going on with this guy. And that's when I got fired ordered to go in for psychiatric evaluation, yeah. which they did misdiagnosed me three times while I was mm. in a state of full-blown mania. But then four months later, after I had crashed into depression, which is unmistakable. I mean, you can't, they couldn't misdiagnose my depression. I was just yeah. horribly depressed. And at that point, they did a little more research and connected some dots and then came to the conclusion that I was bipolar one with psychosis. Yeah. Yeah. And so so that 11 year period from 2003 to 2014, um, you're, you're still in I mean, you're in active service. Um, you're you're doing what you've always done, but at a very high level um, in terms of your leadership and role and responsibilities and those kind of things. So then um, what 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 can you share about that time 
around 2014 that would help um, just help our listeners kind of understand the maybe the gravity of that situation that you found yourself in? So by the time I got to 2014, I had had over a decade of moving up the bipolar spectrum. And if what I really had was all the classic symptoms. Um, I had grandiosity, tremendous grandiosity. I thought and believed I was the smartest man in the world. Mm -hmm. I thought that I, in my mind, held the key to world peace, if only people would listen to me. Um, I described my religiosity, which was yeah, yeah. astounding, and and yeah. um, uh, maybe maybe the most powerful characteristic of my mania. But I started talking faster and faster, forced, pressured speech. I would sometimes talk for hours at a time without stopping, um, mm -hmm. and people reported this to me independently. Um, one friend said that I actually talked to him for eight hours straight. I conducted an interview for someone applying to be a dean of one of our colleges, and he uh, he said, you talked for four straight hours, and I had no idea what you were talking about. But it, And then I would, um, meetings would run, you know, a meeting that was supposed to be one hour might go for two, three, people would get up and start leaving or whatever. Um, I was late for everything. I lost mm -hmm. track of time. Um, I stopped doing administrative paperwork. I just it just built yeah. up or somebody else took it and did it. I just thought I was too important. I, I didn't pay attention to it. I just said, hey, I, I'm, I'm the big idea guy. I'm the Apostle Paul. I'm the world mm -hmm. peace guy. Um, I started having more and more flights of ideas and they would just happen continuously where I, I, my mind was racing with one, you know, quote, brilliant idea after another. Sure. And, a, and a lot of them actually were really good ideas, but a lot of them were just, it was too much, too fast. Nobody could keep up with it. Um, I would go into lecture halls and conference rooms and classrooms and just take over. So I'd walk in, interrupt, and just start teaching the stuff that I wanted to teach about world peace, security, my mm -hmm. big ideas, et cetera. So it was very disruptive. It was rude. It was bad behavior. Um, one of the college commandants actually started posting a sentry outside the door to his building to give him a quick call if I was going to wander in. And mm -hmm. then he would come and divert me and you know steer me away. Um, that was on duty. Off duty, I started drinking more and more. And the, you know, the mania makes you want made me want to drink and then when i drank i'd get more manic and it would just go yes. up and up and up and the yes. opposite would happen when i was in depression again wanted to drink i would and it was self-medication and then i'd get more depressed yeah but um i i got to the point where i was i i went about three months with virtually zero sleep none at all yes. um and that of course fueled my mania even more and I would be sending emails and text messages all hours of the day and night. And I wouldn't just send them to the person who needed it. I would CC hundreds of people, mm -hmm. um, you know, people in the university, in the Pentagon, on in Congress, at other universities, in business. I mean, it, it really, in my mind, I was trying to get everybody connected and build a network of networks. But yeah. it was it was out of control. Um, yeah. And then I would, unable to sleep, I would usually wander out of the house about 12, 1 in the morning, and I would, I would pace around the university grounds, and I would go into the buildings and, you know, read the art and the historical stuff, and then I would talk to the security guards, um, and, and then I would usually, you know, hit the weights, do a workout, then I'd go home, jump on my bike, and I would ride in the wee hours of the morning all around Washington, D.C., and one of the most memorable things was I would ride up to the top of Capitol Hill, which actually is a hill, and I would bomb down the hill on my bike as fast as I could go and lift up off the ground, and I would be flying on my bike, and I would look down and see myself pedaling down on the ground. And I'd be mm -hmm. up flying, looking at you know the monuments in Washington, D.C., and it was really thrilling, but again, it was uh, it was a hallucination, and yeah. um, and so those are just some of the things that I did that were 
Uh, one other thing that was kind of strange, my wife really thought it was manic, was I would wake up. Well, I, I didn't wake up. I was already awake. I would go yeah. out on the, we lived in a huge house. I'd go out on the third floor ledge. I'd climb out the window and, with a cup of coffee and I would watch the sunrise and I would pray and meditate. It was probably the only quiet time I had, read the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it was dangerous because I could have slid off the slate roof and, yeah. you know, gotten hurt really bad falling through yeah. three stories. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and, and so thank you, first of all, for being able to, to share that, that detail and that depth, because I think it really uh, creates a clear picture of what uh, life was like in, in that moment. And so uh, to, to say, okay, this isn't clearly, it's no longer functional. Where, whereas in the past, this hypomania type state was in some ways productive and, and useful and enhanced, I think is a word that you used, kind of what you were doing. But now it had gone way beyond that and, and was creating impairment and dysfunction um, not just for you, but for the systems that you were in too, both within your household and and outside of your household within your career. Um, and so there's this um, point at which you're, it sounds like compelled really to seek treatment. Um, and that was not a, that was not a slow or, or that, excuse me, a simple pr process either. It sounds like that was quite, uh, quite a journey in and of itself. So, so, just talk about that that kind of process of getting into care and treatment, and some of the challenges that you faced initially there. So, during the time that I just described, where I was in full blown mania, um, uh, people started writing anonymous uh, reports and notes to my chain of command, my boss. And so the boss, who was a great guy, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, he looked at all this stuff and he knew me very well because we had worked together five or six times in the past. And so he looked carefully and then he came to the conclusion that he needed to get me out of that job at National Defense University. It was a pressure cooker, high stress job. And so he, he made his decision and I got a, a, a note report to the chairman's office at 10 o'clock Monday morning. This was in July. And so I went in and I didn't know if I was going to get promoted, deluded, deluded mind or get fired. And the um, first person I saw was the lawyer. And I said, oh, no promotion today. You know, when the lawyer's there, that's, there's nothing good. Mm. Um, so General Dempsey came across the room and he gave me a big hug and he said, Greg, I love you like a brother. You've done an amazing job. I give you an A+. Plus. But your time at National Defense University is over. You have until 5 p.m. today to resign voluntarily or I will fire you. And, oh, by the way, I'm ordering you to get a mental health evaluation at Walter Reed this week. So I went in. So and I was so manic that you would think I would be disappointed or dejected. No, none of those. I, I, I thank General Dempsey. I said, sir, thank you. God put me in this job. Now he's going to put me somewhere else and I'm going to go on and do bigger and better things, which I really am doing this bipolar work is the most important thing I've ever done. I, I you know, I never would have thought it, but it's true. Um, and so I went to Walter Reed Military Hospital and they evaluated me. Three different doctors evaluated me three different on three different occasions. And they came to the conclusion that I was fit for duty, I was fine, there was nothing wrong with me. But they completely missed the, missed the ball. Uh, yeah. And there's a, a number of reasons. Number one, um, you know, as you know, you can, even when you're manic, you can have a coherent, completely rational conversation. And so that fooled them. I, I wasn't trying to fool them, but we sat down and we had a conversation. And so it was, it was like a mask masking my bipolar disorder and they said this guy's a general you know generals don't get bipolar disorder he's in his 50s they don't get you know so they had all these reasons why i was okay but i also strongly believe 
that the medical people didn't talk to my chain of command, you know, and so they didn't talk, they didn't share notes because the chairman's people could have given them a folder with dozens of detailed reports about how yeah. crazy I had gone and they yeah. didn't see that. And so I went in three times because when I got the first clean bill of health, I sent it to my chain of command in the Pentagon and they said, we don't believe this, get another evaluation. And I got another one that said, okay. So anyway, I went back three times and all of them said, good. And then I became very bitter because I thought that my people had been out to get me and they sabotaged mm -hmm. me by writing these reports when look, the three doctors said I'm fine. And, you know, so I thought I was fine and that I got set up and there was nothing wrong with me and that these people had, you know, maliciously brought me down. And that made me very bitter, very angry, went into a state of rage. So which was also mania, but manifested yeah. in anger and rage. I'm really yeah. fortunate that nothing bad happened. I didn't get arrested, you know, nothing really terrible. But over the next four months, I spiraled, then crashed into hopeless depression, terrifying psychosis. And when I went back into these same doctors four months later, they said, aha. And, and I told right. them, I said, I've never felt like this. I am sick. There's something wrong with me. And then they were able to piece it together and say bipolar type one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you had talked about how lithium has been a medication that's really been uh, pivotal uh, in resolving and uh, a process of recovery for you and stability. Um, and, and I mean, lithium has been around forever. I mean, it is a very old uh, medication. And so sometimes, you know, even when I've talked with clients or when I'm teaching now and we talk about lithium, uh, and how it's still used, there can be some head scratches about it. Like, oh, you know, this is a, um, a very potent medication that can become uh, even toxic at times for, for individuals that are taking it. So, so was it at that point that, that lithium was started um, or were there other like medications or interventions that, that were being tried at that time? So November 2014, I was diagnosed and I was prescribed a variety of different medications. None of them helped me. All they did was make me sleepy and groggy. Sure. I was, yeah. I was then I was retired from the army a few months later. No continuity of care plan. I was pretty much dumped into the civilian sector. And a, I, I, I started seeing a civilian psychiatrist and therapist, but nothing they did really worked. And that went on for about a year. And then finally, I got into the VA and I got I was hospitalized because of suicidal ideations and, you know, everything I had going on, the hallucinations, yeah. Yeah. terrible depression. And the the hospitalization was good. It was a, it was it was like the beginning of my journey to recover but I okay. stayed in terrible depression, continued with psychosis until August of 2016. So five or six months after I'd been hospitalized, uh, we they prescribed lithium. And that within three three to four days, my depression vanished. The, the psychosis pretty much went away. And I've never gone into either depression or mania in seven years, not, not at all. And it's wow. it's as if the um, lithium has constructed a roof and a floor, and it's like I can't go through the roof. So if I start moving up towards mania, I bump into the roof or the ceiling, and then and I stay in this safety band. And then if I do start going into depression, I hit the floor, and I don't go into depression. I I stop yeah. at the floor, and that's kind of what it's done for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a a really interesting way of describing it because you you talked about how uh, you know military service and your Christian faith were kind of like guardrails for a long right. time in your life, and now and now lithium has uh, stepped in in terms of providing some guardrails with emotional stability um, and and allowing you to operate in a really functional way within those. Exactly. Yes. 
They, they, yeah. lithium is really my guardrail. And I also take lamotrigine and lorazidone as well. That's part of okay. the, you know, the combination. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And combination therapies are again, super common. Um, and, and oftentimes when that, um, combination therapy is dialed in and, and tested over time. Yeah. Very, very effective, uh, in that. So, um, so I'm curious, like you've been on this pathway now since, um, you know, 2016 was a real, another inflection point, but turning toward, you know, a, a return to health and wellness and stability for yourself. Um, how, how did, how did you decide to take on this mission of sharing your story and sharing your experiences, um, with, with all of us? Well, when I was hospitalized, uh, I had a vision of writing my story, speaking about it, and doing what I'm doing now. And uh, but I was in absolutely no condition to do that. And yeah. my therapist said, "You know, that's that's a really great idea, but you know, look around right now. You're hospitalized and you're in a locked facility. Um, I'd, I'd put those ideas on hold and come back to them later when you're." in your recovery process. And if you think it's a good thing to do and it makes you feel better, then I would suggest it's probably a good idea to do. And it was it was funny in, in 2020, just three years ago, so four years after the lithium and the stability, um, my mom passed away. And suddenly in the aftermath of her uh, death, I got this surge of energy and enthusiasm and it all focused into telling and writing my story. And so for the next year, every single day, I was at the keyboard banging away. And I took one year and wrote the story. Okay. And then I had to get into, okay, how do I get this thing published? Which is a whole nother thing. Of course, yeah. And, and during, during the time of trying to get it published, I still had the bug to write and tell my story. So I started writing shorter articles and I got about 25 of them published in the last two years. And then people would read the articles and then get a hold of me and say, Hey, can you give a talk? And I was giving talks to everything from, you know, local rotary club, churches, retreats, all the way to fortune 500 companies, major military commands, VA hospitals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so then things started to snowball and, and I, more and more speaking, more and more writing. And then I found a publisher a year ago and, you know, here it yeah. is. It's, it's, it actually, is. it's actually published. And uh, so, and now with the publication of the book, uh, I'm getting, you know, lots and lots of invitations to speak, to do grand rounds at hospitals and med schools yeah. Um, you know, the Army, the Navy, um, VA, et cetera, are all really interested in my story, as well as, you know, big corporations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, and it's wonderful because, um, you know, there's, there's, such a, there's such a need uh, within our communities across our country for, um, for hope for a recognition that we can uh, find healing, that we can move through uh, the, some of the darkest seasons of our life. And, and because in some ways, because we've gone through that, have a, a clear sense of purpose and meaning. Um, you know, obviously within military service and, and uh, and veterans, there's a lot of discussion around post-traumatic stress. Um, but I never want to focus on that at the exclusion of all these other aspects of our mental health, whether, whether it's depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder or anything else, um, that really the full gambit of caring for our mental health uh, for those that are serving and have served our, our country through through military services so critically important. So there's just so much overlap here because um, with these kind of different pockets, right? Of mm -hmm. of you 
providing a, a story, you know, to a Fortune 500 company <laughs> or or a hospital system or something that will uh, give hope, right, to to folks that are maybe going through a dark time and of their own. Uh, but uh, yeah, we just can't overlook the the unique message that you have for those uh, in our military service. Uh, and so I'm I'm curious, like. It's been a it's been a road for you, obviously, and in in, uh, in terms of your relationship with uh, the military, uh, where are things at today? And you know, you've kind of shared you had a lot of people that looked to you that trusted you, and then there was this time of like you can't be here anymore. Um, so so, what's your relationship now uh, with your military brothers and sisters? It's actually very good. Uh, you know, a number of people who I had served with who were, you know, three and four star generals and admirals and so forth, um, they wrote wonderful endorsements for the book. And my boss, General Dempsey, who was the chairman who had to let me go, um, he wrote a magnificent foreword to the book that's fantastic. Mm. And, uh, and you know, I've, I've thanked him over the years. I think he made exactly the right decision because I was, you know, just not in mental and emotional state to continue to lead this large, complex, important institution. And he, he told me, he said, you know, Greg, I've seen situations where the leaders start getting attacked by the people below them. And you can't win because it'll go from anonymous complaints to inspector general complaints to congressional complaints, and you're going to lose. So I'm going to actually pulling you out of there is going to protect, help protect you and your family. And so I, I feel fortunate that it turned out as it did, and it wasn't a whole lot worse. And I feel great about my mission, um, you know, what I'm doing to, to, to tell my story. Um, you know, and I felt really an obligation. I mean, how many people who were generals in the army come down with severe bipolar disorder that almost kills them yeah. and then launch a journey of recovery and come out of it, you know, and I know my journey is going to go for the rest of my life until I pass away. But, you know, I've got the ability, the intellect, the writing skills, the time, you know, the financial resources that I can put into this story to help other people. And I feel, you know, really, really good about it. And going back to the faith thing, you know, I really believe, you know, God, you know, I, I don't know whether he just lets it happen or he makes it happen or whatever, but somehow it happened. And it's a perfect combination for me to be in kind of a ministry or a mission that I'm yeah. in right now. And I'm, I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and boy, I've, th there's kind of an underlying question there that so many people of faith ask um, when they're facing any, any, really any kind of challenge, but particularly ones of, of mental and emotional health. It's like, what, why is this happening? You know, or what, what, you know, is, what have I done wrong or something along those lines, you know, like, haven't I been faithful or haven't I <laughs> tried my best? These kind of, kind of questions that can emerge from it. And it's, it's a recognizing or, or maybe a pause to recognize that we, we do live in a fallen world, right? There, right. this, this side of heaven, there's no perfection and that sin affects all of us in this fallen world. And that affects our biology too. And so whether it's something, you know, as awful as cancer or as awful as bipolar disorder or whatever the next thing is, like that's oftentimes, you know, it, it's just a part of living in this fallen world. But having a good and gracious God to be right there with us walking through that storm that he can, he can redeem even those worst moments of our life and use that for good to use that for good in our life and, and the good in so many other people's lives too. And that's really a testament to what you're saying here is that you would never have wished to gone through any of that, 
right? And you wouldn't wish it on anybody else, but you did go through it. And now it can be used to benefit so many other people, to share your story, to share that hope and inspiration, um, and, and really sharing your faith too, right? I mean, sharing that the love of God has sustained you through this, as well as the love of those around you that God's placed in your life. And I know we haven't talked too much about family, but you've referenced your wife a few times, 41 years, you said, of marriage. Mm -hmm. Yes. Congratulations. Thanks. That's amazing. I'm, I'm halfway there. Okay. <laughs> so, so, um, and I, we, I know we have to land this plane here in, in terms of our time together, but, but I'm curious if you could just say a little bit about the role like your wife and, and family has played uh, in this process of recovery for you as well? Well, my wife is really, you know, a rock. And so she has been there all the way, didn't give up on me. I mean, you know, a lot of spouses in the same circumstances would have abandoned their sick partner. And it happens a lot. Um, yeah. So, yeah. and she's a woman of faith. And she said that the key to going through this whole journey was perseverance, just one foot in front of the other, never quitting, not giving up. So she's been just great. And we've really, we moved from New England to Florida. We've been here for seven years and the bright okay. sunshine and the warmth have been really healthy. So she's terrific. And um, we, we have a great time down here. Um, we've got three sons. Uh, two of them live with bipolar disorder, which is pretty rough. Um, yeah. you know, they're in their thirties now and it's, it's been, you know, a tough road as you, as you are well aware. And yeah. then our third son, um, is, you know, no mental or emotional issues that we're aware of. He's actually a green beret in the army and doing really well as an army officer. So family's great. We're actually going to have, uh, the whole family together this weekend, which would be, be pretty cool. And we're going to, uh, babysit our son's dog, um, because he's deploying for six months to Moldova, which is down yeah. between uh, Ukraine and Poland. So yeah. we're going to take his dog for six months, which will be fun. Okay, okay, you'll have a you'll have an extra uh, member of the household for that <laughs> yeah. time. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I and I appreciate that. Um, you know, there there is a genetic component for sure to a lot of our mental health. Um, and so some of these things are quite heritable uh, in, in that sense. And so uh, the fact that you guys are able to be be together this weekend and uh, before your son's deployment, that 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 seems like a really special uh, and, and meaningful time for all of you guys. Yes, it is. We're extremely grateful. Um, super fortunate to have you know, a really tight knit, uh, family that loves each other. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Greg, if people are, um, uh, interested in, in getting the book, uh, which I'm, I'm highly encouraging, um, and I'll, I'll put some links in the show notes for our conversation when I, when I publish this, uh, so that people can access it. But, um, you know, if they're just listening and they want to access and find the book, where's the best way to do that? I think the easiest is to go to Amazon. And, yeah. you know, my name is Greg Martin, and the book is called Bipolar General, My Forever War with Mental Illness. So you can mm -hmm. you can go to Amazon and order it. They, they're still calling it pre-ordering uh, mm -hmm. until the 15th of September, but you can pre-order. It's, it's going to hit the street on the 15th. Yeah. Um, and if you could also go to Barnes and Noble, um, okay. pretty, pretty much wherever books are sold, but I, I think yep. Amazon is pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if people are interested in, uh, in, you know, reaching out to you, uh, maybe, you know, wa wanting to hear more from you, have you speak somewhere, what, what's the best way for, for people to get in touch with you? The best way to get in touch is to go to my website. Um, www.bipolargeneral.com. Okay. And I'll also give out my, my email. Um, it's Greg with two G's in the end, Greg Martin seven, nine 
at gmail.com. But if okay. you shoot me an email, you know, I'll hopefully I'll get it. And then, you know, we'll, we'll engage in an email conversation. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you being open to sharing that. And um, so for those folks that want to reach out, they have that opportunity. I'll link all of that information in the show notes so that people can access it there. Um, Greg, it's been such a blessing to get to visit with you today. Um, I really uh, value this time. Um, I'm excited to be able to share this episode out and, and share your story uh, with the WellMind audience. So thank you so much for being with me today. You're welcome. It's been a real honor and a privilege and a pleasure. And uh, you're doing a great job. I really enjoyed this entire session. Thank you, Greg, for joining me and sharing your story with the WellMind community. And many thanks to all of you for spending your time with me today. If you enjoyed my conversation with Greg, please check out previous episodes, click rate and subscribe through your podcast app, and just let people know about the WellMind. Share this episode with someone you think might enjoy giving it a listen. Also, please check out the links in the show notes so that you can gain access to information on how to pick up Bipolar General, My Forever War with Mental Illness. September 15th, that's the release date. So go out, pick that one up. Many thanks as always to the staff here in the Bethany Lutheran College podcast studio. I appreciate everything that you do to make the well mind possible. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, be well.